<clears throat> Isaiah 59, that, that verse that says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against it. You know, there's been a lot of work done on that particular verse over the last, you know, 20 years. And there's this little tiny debate that is always taking place underneath the surface with, uh, with some of the, the Hebrew context and the, and the, and just, but just where does the comma go, right? You may have heard that, but there's always this little debate. And I like, I like the way the other side reads it sometimes, not when the enemy comes in like a flood, the enemy will raise up a standard against it. Some people have moved the comma over and they've said, uh, when the enemy comes in, like a flood, the Lord will raise up a standard against it. And, and that's where I, I really believe, you know, people like Ben and his organization, they're, they're the flood. They're, they're part of the flood. How many of you want to be a part of the flood? Amen. And yeah, let's be a part of the flood. Okay. So uh, this morning, we're just going to continue on with our, our series. And we're getting ready to switch our series here in a couple of weeks. And we're going to be, we're going to be talking about the questions of Jesus. And I'm very excited about, about that series. We're going to go through 12 of the most important questions that Jesus asked in the Bible. Jesus actually asked, um, I'm trying to remember now, uh, somewhere around 800 questions. He was asked only 100, and, no, he only asked, I think, 83 questions. He only answered three questions. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the most important Jesus that Jesus ever asked. How many of you know that, that, it, that oftentimes when Jesus asks you a question, it's not that he doesn't know the answer? right? He's waiting to see what your answer is so then he can then go to work on you to try to get you aligned into his will. That's how, that's how the Lord works. And some, so many times we're looking for Jesus to uh, answer our questions for us, but he just doesn't do it in the New Testament. He actually only directly answered three questions and everything else was a work of the Spirit. So, so I, I, I'm already in my new series. I can't go back now. I'm already there. I need to stay right here. John chapter one. Okay, so here's where we're at today with the minutes that we have left. I, I want to just maybe just hit this as fast as I can, and then we'll we'll move on and we'll wrap the service up this morning. Uh, usually, at during the holiday season, you know, I always do a different aspect of the incarnation every Christmas. This year, we're going to do something a little different. And what I was really feeling for this morning was to go back to John chapter one and hit something this morning that I really haven't done before as a part of this. Now, Jesus is the way maker. God is the way maker, right? So God has a tendency to make a way and to do things that are beyond your control and beyond your ability. So God puts a thought into your heart, and then all of a sudden, God makes a way for it. When someone like a, a Ben Cooley or others that you may know or maybe have been here, people that you're acquainted with, when God puts a thought in their heart, they go rent a stadium or, or their version of that. It doesn't make any sense to the natural mind. And so the question is, why did it work? The reason why it worked is because it wasn't Ben actually doing the work. It was Jesus doing the work. And so there's a transition that takes place in the life of a Christian. If you really want to make an impact, if you really want to make a difference, there is something that has to happen in the heart of every single believer where you stop trying to do the work. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Somewhere along the line, we surrender the control of what it is that we're trying to do. Now, here's something that I really believe. I believe that one of the great travesties of life for every single believer is that we never learn the benefit of giving over the control. We tend to think that everything's going to get messed up if we're not in control. Some of you are just total control freaks. I want all of the control freaks in the room to lift your hand. Come on. Okay. Now that there's a lot of you. Oh my goodness. No wonder. I, no wonder I'm so tired. You, you people are all control freaks. Every single one of you, uh, you know, the only people who didn't raise their hand were my children and they were just afraid. So, so, you know, there's, there's something that happens when you just give up control. It is the most unbelievable, anointed, incredible experience that anyone can ever have in your whole life to give up control. Because the Bible says that Jesus has more for you than you see, than you hear, or that your mind believes. That if you love him, you pour yourself out into this love relationship, and the next thing you know, you're a part of something that you never thought you would ever be a part of. It didn't come from you. You didn't think of it. It wasn't a part of your gift mix. It wasn't something that somebody came to you and had to convince you to do. Jesus did it. Now, the reason why that works is because there is something in John chapter 1 that is vitally important to the life of the believer. Now, John chapter 1, the first 14 verses probably are 14 of the most important version, verses in all of Scripture. 
Now, if you're new, we have so many new believers here, but listen, if you're new and you don't read the Bible, you haven't read the Bible a lot, I want to, I want to direct your attention to John chapter 1. There might be 10 portions of Scripture that you have to read, that you have to know this is one of them. As a matter of fact, I'd even go so far as to say without John chapter 1, we wouldn't have any theology, we wouldn't have any doctrine, we wouldn't have any fulfillment of the Old Testament, any of the prophecies, nothing would have taken place without John chapter 1. That's how important this, these first few verses are. Now, for those of you who were here at Christmas, you heard me do this, and I'm going to do all of that series in like 30 seconds just to set up my, my two or three thoughts for this morning. But let me go through John chapter 1 with you. We'll start in verse 1, and I want you to kind of just, I want you to try to open your heart up because the, the key to the life that we're discussing is this. It's this. It's not our ideas. It's not our thoughts. Here we go. In the beginning was the Word. So we have, we have the word. Okay, so the living, breathing word of God. How many of you know the word is not the page? It's not the ink. The word is something much deeper and permanent than that, right? It's more supernatural than that. We understand that. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So the word itself, the truth, was with God in heaven before any of us were here. So the truth came before you, and the truth came before me. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. So the truth was with God. And the word, it says, here we have Trinitarian language, but the word was God. So God is the truth. So the word, the truth was with God and the truth was God and the word was God and he was with God in the beginning. So now they've personified the truth and God. They've turned this big God into a person. He, a pronoun. He was with God in the beginning. You got the word, you got God, and now you've got a he. He was with God in the beginning and through him all things were made and without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him there was life and that life was the light of all mankind and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So the the truth and God and the he came into the world, they brought light and nothing in the dark, the world of darkness can overcome it. That's why when the enemy comes in like a flood, How many of you know there's no such thing as a dark light? You've got a flashlight, but not a dark light. Light always defeats darkness. There's nothing, it's a part of the the natural fiber of creation. It's, It's spiritual and it's natural. You can't, darkness can never defeat light. You can never put darkness into a place where light is. Wherever light goes, it exposes. Wherever light goes. That's why the Bible says that in him there are no shifting shadows. Because Jesus is always at 12 noon right over your head. How do you know that Jesus knows everything that's going on in your life? Because he has no shifting shadows. He's not over here so that when he shines down on you, there's a dark place over here where you can hide something. I just got news for you. Some of you people who have hidden sin, God sees it all. There's no shifting shadows. You can't hide it here. You can't hide it back here because Jesus is up here and he sees everything. Can I hear an amen? Okay, so whenever the light comes in, the darkness must flee. That's the law. That's the principle. And then it goes on and says this. Then there was a man, verse 6, sent from God. Now we have the testimony of John the Baptist. Let me jump down now to verse 14. And the word became flesh. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. So the word, the God, the word, the truth, and the light became flesh and dwelt among us. Now, for those of, for those of you, uh, you know, for the Greek scholars who understand the tabernacle, listen, so here, here's the idea. Very quickly, in the Old Testament, if you wanted to be close to God, you had to go into a tent, right? We all know that. He was in the Ark of the Covenant. He's back in a room. Nobody can go back there except the high priest. And he only did it every f- few years. You had to be perfect. You had to be clean to go into the presence of God inside his tent, inside his tabernacle. The word actually means tent or dwelling. And so every once in a while, the guy would, and, and they would put bells all over their body, right? How many of you know the story? How many of you know the story? They put bells all over the body of the priest because they, then they tie a rope to his leg and he would go in and stand before the ark. And if he wasn't clean, the ark, uh, fire would come out and strike him dead. And he wasn't clean enough. But God knows that none of us are ever going to be clean enough to be in his presence. We're never going to make it. So God, he, the flesh, the light, the word said, you know what? God, Word, flesh, Jesus, they're not going to be able to handle this. So instead of expecting them to come into our tent and I'm going to kill them all, how about I just go down and get in their tent? So when Jesus came down to earth, he reversed the process where we had to go into his tent. He said, forget it. They're all going to fail. So I'm going to go down into their tent. 
I'm going to get into the place where they dwell. Now, this is a, it changes everything. There's nothing that stays the same. Because Jesus just dropped down out of heaven. He walk, he's walking around, and he gets in your tent. He gets in your dwelling. He's with you everywhere you go and everything that you do. When you live with the knowledge that Jesus is in your life in a physical way, in a real way, right here, Jesus is right here, it changes everything. Because now now everything is not seen the same. You're not alone hoping that Jesus is going to help you out. Jesus is actually in the driver's seat trying to move you forward to get you to where it is he wants you to go. And one of the great things, even uh, Pastor Tosh just said this morning, one of the things that we deal with is the closeness and the nearness of God and what we're doing. So many people struggle with the thought that God's not with them or God's not near to them. God's not with them. God's not a part of what they're doing. When you understand the incarnation, you understand that, that Jesus did everything that he had to do to get down here onto the earth, to wrap himself in the flesh of a person, to get into your life, he's always there. I heard a quote once a while back. I thought of it because he brought up the last, last president, but the quote goes like this. If you want to meet the president of the United States, and by the way, there's three or four of you in this room that have, that have done that. Oh, it's awesome. Probably it's never going to happen. If I want to meet the governor, probably not going to happen. If I want to spend time with the mayor, Maybe if I make an appointment, wait three months. If I want to meet, if I want to play golf with the greatest golfers in the world, I can do that if I give them $50,000 for their, for their charity, I can play nine holes with them. But if you want to spend time with the creator of the universe, you just close your eyes, you take a breath, and you say, Jesus, we need to have a chat. Because my marriage might be a mess, my business might be a mess, I don't know what I'm doing in ministry, I don't know where I'm going, I don't feel anything, and I feel like you're near. And as soon as you experience that, Jesus goes, I'm not out there, I'm right here. I came from there, down to here, to get into your dwelling place, to get into your tent. I live with you, I walk with you, I talk with you, and it literally revolutionizes. So when God, so when a, when a younger person or any person gets the idea that they're going to go rent a stadium, and they're going to change human trafficking and human slavery or slavery around the world and they go rent a, a center in the city that seats 6,000 people at 26 years old with no money, no help, no team. You just have a word. That's not just a word. That's Jesus standing here speaking into this so that you can fulfill what he's trying to do. He's not trying to fulfill what you want to do. You just got to reverse it and all of a sudden you're in Jesus' tent and let's go. Let's go. Let's go get it done. Let's go make something happen. This is the life of a believer. But so many believers don't live that way. Listen to me. I don't care if you're involved. I don't care if you're in the parking lot. I don't care if you signed up for anything. I don't care if, if Tasha or whoever gets up here and tries to recruit you for everything. By the way, that's never going to stop. It does not matter. Close your eyes. Spend 10 seconds with the creator of the universe who dropped out of heaven, walking around here with you, and he's trying to lead you into things that are not you. You'll never experience God if you try to do everything that's you. Because you're not good enough. You're not strong enough. You're not clean enough. You're not good enough. There's a rope tied around your ankle. And if it wasn't for the grace of Jesus, we'd be dragging you out of the tent every day dead. But because of grace, Jesus is right here. Now, let me give you, let me give you a, a couple thoughts real quick. That what happens is, let me give you just five thoughts, five reversals that take place when you live an incarnational life where you recognize the presence of Jesus in everything that you do and how he's leading you into what, what you're about to do. It's a different kind of life. It's a different experience. You will never have enough. You, you, people will look at you and go, man, you're so successful, this is going to but it's not enough because it's not mine. It has to be used for the kingdom. You'll always have some relational drama in your life. Because Jesus is trying to purify your community to get you all to think like Jesus so that you actually say, I'm sorry, and I forgive you. The hardest things in the world to say. You know, my kids are growing up. One of the things that they love is when they have an argument, we all sit down. You say, I'm sorry. Now you prepare yourself because you're going to say, I forgive you. And what happens? I'm sorry. I forgive you. Nothing changes. And then one child goes, they didn't mean it. And the other child goes, they didn't mean it either. It was an insincere apology. It was an insincere forgiveness. <laughs> Jesus just needs to come down and Jesus needs to get in everybody's business because it's a different way to live. I'm going to give you some reversals. Number one, first re reversal is a leadership reversal. Great leadership doesn't result in the presence of Jesus. 
The presence of Jesus results in great leadership. I so appreciate the 80s and the 90s. You know, uh, when John Maxwell's at his peak doing all his stuff and he's still going, he's incredible. I've read all of his books. I went to his seminars. I even preached at his church one time. Do you know how intimidating it is to preach at John Maxwell's church? You're walking down the hall and there's like 500 quotes of leadership and pictures of John Maxwell all the way to the pulpit. And the farther you walk, you just, I'm not a leader. I'm not a leader. I'm not a leader. Because you're just reading all the stuff you don't do, right? Great leadership does not result in the, in the presence of Jesus. I appreciate that season. But there were so many leaders that wanted to be good leaders and, and, and led by principle. And we read the, this laws and 17 laws and all these other guys. And all of a sudden, we were all of a sudden per performing. I've got to do this. I've got to do all these 12 things if I'm going to be a great leader. And leaders just wore themselves out. Leaders got tired uh, of just trying to be a great leader because the body of Christ had a dearth. It, there was an emptiness in the leadership category. The Lord filled that. But when that was all over, all these tired leaders needed Jesus and the grace of God. Some of you here were in leadership. You've been in churches. You got burned out and wiped out. The Lord just wants to come and reverse it. Great leadership doesn't result in the presence of Jesus. The presence of Jesus results in great leadership because all of a sudden you're not leading. We're not leading according to what I think or what I feel or what I see or, or a book I read or, or a, a ministry in the city. I'm leading according to the presence of Jesus. I'm only accountable for his presence and for his purpose. I'm not held accountable for what the fruit is. If my heart is right and I'm doing what he's called me to do, all of that is in his hands. Number two, Healthy relationships can't build your relationship with Jesus. Other healthy relationships, they can't build your relationship with Jesus, but your relationship with Jesus builds healthy relationships. We live in this world today where so many people are just striving and hungry to be a part of something that builds relationships in their life. I totally get it. But you will never find in a spouse, how many married people have already learned that one? You never, your spouse is not Jesus. Ladies, don't say it so loud. You, just be, just, just, your spouse is not Jesus. Your best friend is not Jesus. Your small group is not Jesus. You know, I, I've heard all these horrible stories about people's small groups in other places and kind of just like, it all blew up and we all hate each other. How can you have a small group in a church and hate each other? Something's not working. It's because we think that I'm going to find in you what I'm supposed to get with Jesus. And, and my thoughts are supposed to match with your thoughts all the time. You know, my thoughts and your thoughts, we're not going to agree on anything, baby, but Jesus, we can be friends. Healthy relationship with Jesus results in healthy relationships with people. Because I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a bigger person, I want to be a better Christian. If people would just say, I'm going to be a better Christian, I'm going to let Jesus help me to be a better Christian. We'd have healthier relationships. But it starts with having a relationship with Jesus. Number three, vision. Vision won't lead you to fulfill the will and the call of Jesus. Jesus calls you to fulfill the vision of God for humanity. It's a different way of thinking. I woke up this morning and I had a vision and I'm going to pray that Jesus fulfills my vision. Question number one, whose vision is it? Because if you give your entire life to building your vision, as big as it is, as many big places as you set or important people that you meet or the number of dollars that end up in your bank account, it may have been so much more if you would have just fulfilled the vision of Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is the one who has a vision for all of humanity. That's our job is to fulfill his vision and call and purpose for humanity, not just for what we think. See, what people do is they have a talent. So they take their talent, they know their talent came from God and they build upon their talent. But that's a narrow way of thinking about how God works. Because just because you sing doesn't mean that you're gonna be a worship leader. And just because, matter of fact, some people who sing shouldn't be worship leaders. Because they, they have other things that God wants to do with them, but they, they like being in front of people, so I'm going to lead worship, and this is going to be, this is my call, this is my call, it's not your call. It's not your call. You actually don't get along with anybody. Worship leading requires something. Here you have the most emotional group of people that God put on the earth. They're creative, they're emotional, they're upset all the time, they're crying. If you don't like their song, they want to leave the church. You don't get along with you. you. You have a different goal. Just because you sing, you don't, you, trust me. What is, the, what is the vision of God for you and for your life? But we sometimes get distracted with what's in the natural, and we miss what God is doing in the spiritual. Having a strong community. Did I, did I skip something? 
Having a strong community doesn't foster a growing Jesus culture. Jesus fosters a culture where he is at the center. Did I skip one? No. It doesn't matter because Jesus, it's all about him anyways. Having strong community doesn't foster a growing culture. Some people think that, that, that we're going to build a culture and we look at other churches or movements and we go, that's, that's the culture that we want in the church. That's how we want our church to be. Now, ecclesiology, the art of the church, very important. As a matter of fact, we're, we're a Holy Spirit church. I'm never going to sacrifice the flow of the Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen? For, for anything, I, I, believe, I believe in the Holy Spirit. I'm a, I'm a spirit-filled believer. But we look at a church and we see their culture and we try to build that. The problem is, is that if we try to build what we see with our eyes instead of walking with the eyes of our faith, we, we, walk, we walk by faith, not by sight. And so if we're walking by faith, you will actually see things that you can't see in the natural. But if we'll never shut our eyes and we could completely consumed by a movement or a church or a certain worship group or whatever it is, out here we're being stimulated to build something a certain way. But every once in a while, we got to close our eyes because we walk by faith and not by sight. And it's the faith that builds the culture that God wants you to have in your life and in your church and in your community. So we got to make sure that Jesus is at the center. And the last one, our strength can't bring about a true Jesus experience at revival. Our strength can't do it. Jesus restores our strength, however, through revival to heal and refresh his people. So all over Colorado right now, people are praying for revival because there's all of a sudden this, there's this thing in the air. There's something going on. Everybody knows it. Eight years ago, it was like, it was like what is, where did I move? What, what, is, what is going on? How, where, where are the church? Where's the people? And all of a sudden, things start to change. And so if we get caught up in praying for revival, we might miss it. What we need to pray is that the presence of Jesus overwhelms so many people's lives, hearts and minds, that all of the arguments disappear. Here's, here's what happens. We live in a, did you know that in some of our communities here, we're so academic and so educated that 80% of South Denver, 80% has a post high school degree, a, ma a bachelor's or a master's degree, 80%. It's the highest in the country in some of the counties down here. Sometimes what we have to do is we have to not lean on our intellect or lean on our strength because true revival doesn't come by praying for revival and then trying to make it happen. It's where the presence of Jesus overwhelms so many people's lives that all of the thoughts of our own just disappear. Listen to me. If God's moving on you and he's touching your life and you're in tears, we're not gonna sit here and talk about the millennium. You don't care. You care that Jesus is touching your life. If God heals your marriage, there's no more arguments. Jesus healed my marriage. If God touched a child, if God healed my body, this is where revival really takes place. It's in a personal relationship with Jesus where he overwhelms us with his love to such a degree that we have nothing left. The Bible calls it being undone. I have been undone in my life more than once. There's nothing like it. God's on you. You're crying. You're wiping tears off of your eyes. And that there's no argument. There's no master's degree. There's no divinity degree. There's no class you can take. It's just Jesus on me, in me, with me, incarnated, walking me around, building me up, straightening me out, giving me vision, walking by faith, closing my eyes, taking me forward. It's a completely different kind of life. Does anyone here this morning want to have more of Jesus? That's what I'm talking about. More of Jesus. More of Jesus. Not more of myself. Not more of you, more of Jesus. Come on, I want more of Jesus. I don't want more of this other stuff. I want more of Jesus. I got, I got nothing left. No more arguments. No more fighting. I just want Jesus to love people. Stand to your feet. Come on, let's wrap this up. Let me have the whole band come. Listen, this morning, if you're in a place in your life and you need more of Jesus in your life, I want you to lift your hand right now. Come on, look at me. If that's you, put your hand up. Some of you have been so dry. You've been in transition. You've been struggling. You don't know what's going on. You don't know where you're going. Lift your hands if that's you. If you need more of Jesus, Father, I pray you'd come this morning and that they would have more of your presence, that they would have more of you, that they would just relax, close their eyes, and let, let you lead them forward. Father, you came from heaven 
Oh my gosh, you came from heaven down to earth. Jesus, you came from heaven to earth to show me the way. Some of you have been struggling with the way. What's the way? Which way am I going to go? Jesus came from heaven down to earth for the way. He wants to take your hand. He's not sending you an email or a text message. He's not a map on your phone. He is a living, breathing, loving God. He's got your hand. He says, come with me. Let's go this way. Come with me. I've got a plan for you. Let's walk this way. Jesus, with these, these people with their hands lifted, I pray for the presence of Jesus to come right now. Father, you move on them you love them you encourage them and you speak speak to their heart and speak to their spirit Lord Jesus this morning now everybody pray this with me say Lord Jesus I'm so happy I'm so grateful that you came to me I can't do it without you I'm nothing without you my life is yours my heart is yours my thoughts are yours my destiny is yours in Jesus name I give you it all. Father, right as I say, Father, right now, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Let's go. In Jesus' name. Come on, some of you are really getting touched by Jesus. Can you clap? Let's go ahead and let's up.